What research yep. can you can you tell us about fish memory and why it's why it's better than simply lasting five seconds? Yeah, well, you know, my first uh, serious science experiment uh, was during my honours, and what I I was I was actually teaching a course about fish and fisheries back in those days, and I used to have a a trawl simulated in a in a really big fish tank. And I, basically, I was trying to show the kids, you know, this is how the fish respond to trawls. This is how the escape routes, you know, for, for avoiding bycatch work and, and, and things like that. And what we noticed during those um, pracs, a couple of hours that we did with the students, is that the fishes just got better and better at avoiding the net every time I had a new prac class come in. And so... During my honours, I actually started measuring the time that individual fish escaped through the escape route in this mm -hmm. trawl net. And what I found is that it improved dramatically over the course of about five runs. And what I did then is I put those fish aside and I tested them almost 12 months later, 11 months. I couldn't do 12 because I had to hand my thesis in. Um, 11 months later, I tested them and they carried on as if it was the same day. So not only did I show rapid learning in fishes, but that long term memory um, was astounding. Mm. Uh, and that at the time was one of the best evidence of long term memory in fishes ever shown. And not surprisingly, it got published in a pretty good journal. Um, Apart, at that time, really, the only other evidence of long-term memory in fishes was about hook avoidance, ironically. So people had done some experiments in the 70s uh, in, in ponds with fishes that were tagged of known identity. And they found that um, if you captured fish on a given lure, uh, they would avoid that lure for basically 11-ish 11, 11 months, almost a year. Mm. So that that... That was a really interesting finding in that I wasn't inflicting pain on my animals at all. Um, yeah, they got a little bit stressed because the net was going to come and, and catch them and they got confined to a, a small space at the end of the tank. But they, there was no pain, but it, it was clearly a, you know, a reasonably stressful experience initially mm -hmm. for them. But they found the solution and they were highly motivated to find the solution. And, and I suspect that that sort of negative feedback uh, really was a, a strong driver of enforcing long-term memory. And you often find that, that you know, negative, you remember ex negative experiences for mm. really long periods of time. <clears throat> so that, that was, I think, it got a lot of press, of course, because you know, memory and fish, holy crap, cow. But, <laughs> I mean, that was in the, in the mid to late 90s um, by the time it was published. Um, so at that time, it was kind of mind-blowing. But it, despite the fact uh, that at the time, you know, it got a lot of media coverage and what have you, every time after that that we showed learning and memory and fishes in all sorts of different contexts and shapes and forms, we basically had the same response from the media every time. <gasps> Fish can remember stuff. And, you know, at that time, I used to have a catchphrase that it was the media that had a short-term memory problem and not fishes. <laughs> Um, so, yeah. uh, look, I think um, that really put that question to, to bed and uh, rapid learning. Uh, and the other thing that we did with those, that same experiment is looked at different group sizes and we found that larger groups of fishes could solve the problem faster. Um, and that led me into a whole world of investigating social learning in fishes. So that's how they learn by interacting and observing one another. Can you tell us maybe some interesting research about the, the social interactions between fish, the social learning perhaps? Yeah, well, I mean, one of the cool things about studying um, social behaviour in fishes, I mean, everybody knows fish school, right? I mean, that's like a standard thing. You see schools of fish all the time and on all the documentaries and things, and they do kind of amazing, whirly, roundy things, like in the same way as flocks of birds do, kind of mesmerising. Mm. Um, one of the things that interests me pretty early on was whether or not fishes could actually recognise one another. Um, and it, it matters because if you think about 
you know, what we know about hierarchies in animals. The only way hierarchies can work is if you know who's who, right? Um, hierarchies were really well studied in primates and chickens and various things, particularly chickens, because they're just so easy to work with. And they have a very, very structured hierarchy. Everybody's heard of the pecking order. Mm -hmm. So they, they only really work uh, if you're capable of recognizing one another. And when I was doing my PhD, nobody really understood if fish could do that. Uh, and so we'd started doing some really simple experiments where we put random fish that had never seen each other before in, into groups and housed them in, in aquariums together. And we asked, well, if you give them a choice between hanging out with their, those individuals that they've been you know, familiar with mm. versus a bunch of strangers, um, do they show a preference for hanging out with the individuals that they recognise? And the answer to that is, yeah, they do. <laughs> it takes about seven to 14 days for them to become familiar. Uh, and over that time, their preference for hanging out with familiar individuals goes up and up and up. And in, indeed, you can, some fantastic experiments were done um, at the University of, of Glasgow where they showed that even if you separated those familiar fish in, and kept them in isolation, um, if you tested them 20 days after 20 days of isolation, they still showed a preference for familiar individuals. And we now know that they can use vision and, and chemical cues and behavioural idiosyncrasies to, to, to identify mm. individuals. Uh, and in fact, they can not only identify individual fish, but they can identify kin. So, how, you know, related individuals, they can tell them apart. Um, so I think that started to blow a few people's minds. Um, but yeah. if you look at the way many of the schools and schooling behaviour worked, um, the structure looks very similar to what we see in, in, uh, in uh, other social animals. And so I guess, you know, in hindsight, it, it shouldn't have been surprising to anybody that they mm -hmm. were capable of recognising each other. And in fact, there's been some really cool research recently using archer fish, which are a, a native Australian fish, uh, looking at human face recognition. And the archer fish can tell people apart. Uh, and, and in fact, if you teach them to recognize people front on, you can even rotate an image, you know, 90 degrees and do a, a profile and they still recognize and differentiate between human faces. How exactly can you tell that they're recognizing the human face? Well, the same kind of thing that you do with any task. When you, when you basically, when you ask a, an animal to do something or to tell you something, you, there's a fair bit of training involved. Mm. So what you do typically is you have a face that you train them to recognize. And every time that face shows up, you give them a food reward. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's positive reinforcement, basically. You could do the same thing with shock if you wanted to, but it's not a very nice way to train animals. Sure. Um, so you can do that and you can train them to positively respond to certain individuals. And you can say, well, if I give you a choice between individual A and individual B, which one are you going to approach in the expectation you're going to get a food reward? Uh, and you can get them to choose between two individuals or three individuals or five individuals or 10 individuals or 20 individuals or what have you. And then you can retrain them to, to recognize other different individuals. It's a long process. Um, but at the end of the day, fishes, we now know, can not only recognize each other, but they also recognize and differentiate between human faces, which makes me feel good because when I was a kid, you know, as I mentioned at the start, I used to think that the fish only responded to me, my pet fish. Mm. And well, maybe maybe that was true. Mm. Tell us more about some of the, the compelling research, maybe another, another piece of research that typically surprises people um, that suggests there's a lot of intelligence in, in fishes. Well, I think um, probably one of the more interesting aspects of um, social cognition is the development of culture now you know when you talk about culture people think oh there's no way you know culture is this weird thing that humans do like you know wearing ugg boots to the beach or something completely <laughs> stupid idea that it's trendy um 
you know, fashion trends often don't make any sense, right? And that's all about um, culture influencing our, our perception and our the decisions and choices we make. <clears throat> and basically what culture is, is these weird spin-offs in, in behaviour that are unique to discrete populations. And if you go anywhere around the world, you will find that, you know, in different cities that there are different cultural traditions and things like that. Now, it wasn't that long ago that we used to think, thought that, that you know, that was a unique thing to people. Uh, and then people started paying attention to chimpanzees. These things nearly always start with primates because primates get a lot of attention. And they noticed that different populations of primates were using tools and various other things um, in, you know, discrete, unique locations. Uh, and it turned out that, oh, well, yeah, okay. So at, at that time they called it proto-culture because animals couldn't have culture, right? So it was proto-culture. <clears throat> kept the primatologists happy and the anthropologists happy. Um, but the reality is it turns out that culture is probably a unique byproduct of social learning. And we know that social learning is widespread in the animal kingdom. So after, after they found it in... Uh, primates, you know, think of things like termite fishing and cracking nuts with anvils and, and things like that. Um, they also found it in birds. Uh, of course, the birds always follow the primates because, you know, after primates, birds are really heavily studied. Um, and they found, for example, that, you know, different populations of the same species of birds uh, had unique songs, right? They, they shared songs and, and those sorts of things. Um, in New Caledonia, they found that the crows were, were building tools and things like that, and, and that, that was culturally inherited and um, that tradition developed in, in complexity over time. And, of course, then they found whale songs that were unique to different populations of whales and things like that. Well, it turns out that fishes did the same thing. They also are capable of uh, learning by social learning. We've already sort of discussed that. Mm. But what that means is that information can not only diffuse through populations, um, you know, amongst peers, but it, it can also move across generations. And once social information is transferred from one generation to the next, and the, the, the copying fidelity between generations is, you know, reasonably high, then you can develop these um, cultural traditions in animal populations. And it turns out that um, quite a lot of the movement and migration routes that you see, particularly in coral reef fishes and, and other fishes, are passed on um, culturally. Mm -hmm. um, so there was some fantastic experiments done in the 80s where they translocated entire populations of coral reef fishes to see what would happen to their migration routes and things like that. And uh, if you did a partial replacement, so you took in some, some from one population and put them in with another population, those immigrants would then follow the new migration paths by following the other fishes and going off and doing, and doing the right thing. But if you completely remove the local population and transplanted some novel individuals there, they had no clue about what to do and they just got lost. <laughs> um, so, you know, there's some pretty compelling evidence that that's probably a, a widespread um, phenomenon in fishes. Um, and that older individuals are probably you know, acting in the same way as elephant matriarchs in terms of storing important information, cultural information about feeding locations and hiding locations and spawning locations and things like that. And it's been hypothesized that part of the reason for world fisheries collapse is apart from the fact that we just fish the crap out of the oceans, is that we tend to select um, for the biggest fish and where's the cultural information? stored in, in the minds of the biggest fishes so once you do that you, know, you effectively well it's cultural genocide <laughs> you basically remove the, the cultural information from the population mm. and if, if it's important information like um, spawning locations or something like that then of course that just accelerates population decline yeah it seems it seems to be worse than the human equivalent which is just removing ug boots <laughs> <laughs> yes a lot worse and what's one of the most compelling pieces of evidence you've seen for fish having the capacity to suffer and feel pain i suppose that that's kind of a complex question because because maybe suffering is different to pain let's start with pain 
I was in the same lab as Lynn Snedden, and she was doing some really simple experiments where uh, she would inject a small amount of bee venom into the lips of, uh, of trout, and she would monitor how their behaviour changed. Now, I mentioned all of those sorts of physiological and behavioural measures um, before. She chose a stack of different ones and showed, sure enough, you know, if you inject bee venom into the, to the lips of a trout, they do all sorts of things. They go off their food, uh, they hide in the corner, they try and scratch their mouth um, through irritation, um, they become more aggressive and, and all sorts of things. Mm. Um, and the, the, I think the more compelling evidence for that is if you took the same or, or a similar individual and inject it with saline, which basically controls for the handling and the, the pain associated with the injection, you see that those animals recover really quickly. Um, but the ones that are injected with bee venom, you know, it might be an hour or two before their behaviour returns to normal. And she measured things like activity, breathing rate, how long did it take them to start to, you know, to feed, uh, and all, all those sorts of standard kind of things. Um, so those, those were the first experiments. It was really obvious that the fishes responded to the, 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 the bee bite or sting in, in pretty much the same way that a person would. Um, and the next set of experiments was all about, well, what if you start using painkillers? Can you stop the pain and return behaviour to normal, mm. um, similar to the, the, the control where you measure, where you just inject them with, with saline? And um, the thing that worked best was actually a local anaesthetic, which, you know, if, you, if, you're gonna, if you're going to treat somebody for a bee bite, which you probably wouldn't, but if you wanted to, the best approach would be just to get a little bit of, you know, local anaesthetic at the site. And sure enough, she found that if you treated the, the site of the injection uh, with a, a local lidocaine, then behaviour returned to normal. So it was, it was pretty obvious from those very early experience, experiments that um, fish not only had nociceptors, uh, so they detect painful stimuli and incidentally those nociceptors for all intents and purposes were pretty darn similar to ours um, but their behavior changed in response to painful stimuli in exactly the same way that that ours would mm. uh, or that any other animal would um, and then there are the more sophisticated questions about you know how cognitively engaged are they and then you know we already spoke about those complex decision making um, trade-offs that fishes are making with respect to the, you know, the shock and their access to their friends and their food. So fish are not reflexively responding to pain. Their behaviour changes for the long term. Mm. They show long-term avoidance in, of context and situations that have been previously associated with pain. So if, if you, for example, if you divide your aquarium into a, a, a black side and a white side, and you repeatedly shock a, a fish on the white side or the black side, whatever, it soon learns to stay on one side or the other, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's not a reflex. That's the fish learning. And you can wait for ages down the path and put them back in the tank. And yeah, sure enough, they still show that avoidance behavior. And perhaps even more interestingly, if you then confine them to the location where they were shocked, even if you don't shock them, they show stress and anxiety because mm. they're, they're expecting to be, um, you know, injured or, or uh, feel pain in that context. And so that's why, you know, recognising that fish are cognitively, you know, pre-developed and, and complex, um, it's pretty obvious that they can, you know, anticipate and remember things for long periods of time, and those that negative reinforcement uh, associated with with painful events is is part of that. They recognise contexts in which they they're likely to be um, experience painful things in the future. Uh, so that's that's an important component to it as well. So I, I would argue that the evidence we currently have for pain perception in fishes is just as good as it is for any mammal. Um, and currently, 
I would say it's better than it is for birds.